SpaceX continues expanding Starlink, Super Heavy shuffles at Starbase and major ship and launch pad updates, the last ever Ariane 5 mission, a mysterious Chinese satellite launch, a Falcon 9 launch and landing for the history books, and so much more to cover in today's installment of Space This Week. I'll also be looking back at the last six months of space station activities as 2023 passes its halfway mark, so sit back and enjoy this week's Space Roundup. The big Starbase news last week was the first major steps towards installing the giant water deluge system. We first saw this beast up close a couple of weeks ago in these shots here, captured by Starship Gazer. Now a lot has happened since these shots were filmed. The first component to be transported was the massive central water-cooled steel plate, which was rolled out on Friday and transported down to the launch site. To supply the giant water-cooled steel plate and deluge system, we've been seeing continued pipeworks being lifted into position around the pad, such as this Y-shaped splitter pipe that'll send water to the small and large manifolds. Before all of this took place though, SpaceX performed another night of concrete pouring madness, with over 170 concrete trucks delivering concrete to the site, which was then poured into the launch mount's foundations over the course of about 15 hours. The three concrete pumping trucks then packed up in the morning. After a couple of days of letting the concrete start to cure, we started seeing SpaceX move the steel plate mover underneath the pad in rehearsal for installation of the plate. Shortly after, using the lifting strength of two cranes, SpaceX raised the central steel plate and placed it on the transporter. The reason why it needs to be transported vertically like this is because there's no way it could fit through the gaps in the launch mount legs. Once it was rolled underneath the pad, the cranes lowered their hooks through the orbital launch ring and carefully lifted the plate before steadily lowering it down. Big props to the crane operators, this looked like an incredibly tricky job. The central steel plate is supplemented by three surrounding manifolds, which blast water upwards towards the booster, but not hitting its engines, to serve as the water deluge system. The first of these manifolds was transported to the site last Thursday, as well as the largest of the three. The following day saw the first of the three water manifolds being lifted into position. Surprisingly, we also saw the arrival of around 20 water tankers to the launch site. These are MOVAC trucks and are normally used to pump water out of places rather than fill up water tanks. Perhaps these are here in preparation of water deluge tests which will require the pumping out of water or maybe they really are here to fill up the water deluge system's tanks ahead of its initial testing. To celebrate the 4th of July, SpaceX flew this giant American flag from the launch tower thanks to Maria Pointer for this video. As you can see, the launch tower now has its ship quick disconnect arm, which was missing for quite some time. Yep, we finally saw this reappear at the build site, where it was then transported down to the launch area. Aside from some modifications to its pipework arrangements, not a lot appears to have been changed with this structure. It was then lifted and installed onto the QD arm, positioned a little bit higher than its original position. This is to account for the fact that, going forward, the first stage boosters are going to be slightly taller to make room for the vent ring required for the Starship hot staging. What will the vent ring look like? Well, possibly this. Lab Fadre's cameras captured this test section, moved around the build area to tent one. The section is labelled Hot Stage Load Head, which to me sounds like this could well be a Pathfinder test tank for the Starship Super Heavy Interstage. Do you remember how Ship 28's payload bay door was removed a couple of weeks ago? We suspected that SpaceX wanted to make reinforcements to this, as the payload bay doors for Ship 20, 24 and 25 all needed to be welded shut in the end, presumably because, structurally, it just wasn't up to the job. Well, it looks like SpaceX might have figured things out as we saw the arrival of Ship 28's new payload bay door, which was then installed. As you can see, it looks substantially more robust than the original door, with significant reinforcements around its edge. In a historic first, a super heavy booster was rolled out from the build area down to the Macy's test area. Historically, Macy's has only ever been used for testing starships and small test articles, but recent infrastructure upgrades mean that super heavies can undergo testing here, which is likely what we'll see with Booster 10, since this was the vehicle moved to the site on this occasion. Here's an obligatory human for scale shot. <laughs> super heavy booster testing will be limited to pressurization and cryoproofing tests. It's highly unlikely we'll see static fires, and if we did, it would be limited to only a couple of engines, since to static fire all 33, well, I've spent most of the video 
video so far going through what kind of ground reinforcements are required to facilitate that. Booster 3 did a triple engine static fire on a suborbital pad way back in the day though, so I guess it's not entirely out of the question for some point in the future, though at the same time I'm not really sure if SpaceX have much to gain from single engine tests at this point. We saw two Falcon 9 launches since the last episode of Space This Week, and one of them was for the history books. We'll save that one for a second while we talk about the first Falcon 9 launch last week, which took place on Friday. This was mission Starlink Group 5-13, and saw a Falcon 9 lift off from the Vandenberg Space Launch Center, carrying 48 Starlink satellites to orbit. After separation of the second stage, Falcon 9's first stage successfully touched down on the drone ship Of Course I Still Love You, located in the Pacific Ocean. This specific first stage, B-1063, had been employed in 11 previous missions, Sentinel-6, DART, Transporter 7, OneWeb 19, and 7 Starlink missions. Quite a number of launches then for this booster, but it's got nothing on the new champion. Yep, we have a new Falcon 9 landing record. Earlier today, a Falcon 9 booster carried 22 Starlink V2 minis to orbit on mission Starlink Group 6-5. The first stage blasted off the launch pad at Cape Canaveral for the 16th time, and following stage separation, it once again successfully landed on the Just Read the Instructions drone ship stationed in the Atlantic Ocean. The previous 15 missions for this booster were Crew Demo 2, Anasis 2, CRS-21, Transporter 1 and 3, and 10 Starlink missions. On Wednesday, we had a launch that marked the end of an era. Ariane Space launched the final ever Ariane 5 rocket, carrying two communication satellites to geostationary orbit. One was a German spacecraft designed to research and test new communication technologies, while the other was a French satellite fused by the French Armed Forces, which will allow the military to remain permanently connected during deployments, according to Ariane Space. The Ariane 5 has been in service for almost a quarter of a century, and it has a legendary list of launches attributed to it, a good recent example being the launch of the James Webb Space Telescope. But its retirement now leaves Europe without a heavy lift vehicle, as the Ariane 6 still isn't ready, and we're not entirely sure when it'll be ready. The current vehicle at the French Guiana Space Centre isn't a flight article, it's only there to test the facilities ahead of the real rockets, which are still being assembled in Europe. We saw a somewhat mysterious launch in China last week. On Sunday, a Long March 2C launch vehicle took off from the Qiquan Satellite Launch Centre in China's Gansu province, carrying a single satellite to low Earth orbit. Not a lot has been disclosed about what the satellite is though, only that it's an internet technology test satellite, and that it has successfully ended its planned orbit. Your guess is as good as mine what that could possibly mean. <laughs> What's the latest aboard the International Space Station? Well, now it's July, we've crossed this year's halfway mark. During the first half of the year, a total of 15 individuals from various nations, including Americans, Emiratis, Japanese, Russians and Saudis, have lived and worked aboard the station. Let's look back on the last six months of activities. Just before Crew-5 returned home, NASA's SpaceX Crew-6 mission successfully launched on the 2nd of March, carrying four new crew members to the station. Their primary mission objective involves pioneering research to ensure astronaut and spacecraft safety during deep space exploration, along with studies that could lead to enhanced medical treatments for people back on Earth. Crew-6 continues to remain on board and will return home after approximately six months in space. In partnership with Axiom Space and SpaceX, NASA launched Axiom Mission 2, the second private astronaut mission to the International Space Station, on the 21st of May. The crew stayed on the space station for eight days, conducting experiments and outreach activities before returning to Earth. This year, astronauts continued their work from 2021 by installing the 5th and 6th International Space Station rollout solar arrays through a series of spacewalks. These new arrays measure nearly 20 metres long by 6 metres wide and will partially shade the original arrays, which are 34 metres long by 12 metres wide. The installation of the 7th and 8th rollout solar arrays is planned for future spacewalks. Each new array is capable of generating over 20 kilowatts of electricity, and once all eight are installed, they will increase the station's power production by 30% compared to the current arrays. 
This year hasn't solely been about operational activities. Researchers announced a remarkable 98% water recovery achievement in the US segment of the space station, which is crucial for life support systems during long duration missions beyond low Earth orbit. In March, the crew successfully harvested dwarf tomatoes in the station's veggie facility as part of the Veg05 experiment, examining the effects of light quality and fertilizer on fruit production, microbial safety, and nutritional value. The station's biofabrication facility also made a comeback this year with upgraded capabilities. During its initial space trip in 2019, the facility successfully printed a partial human knee meniscus and a significant amount of human heart cells. The improved capabilities aim to advance research in human tissue printing, offering hope for patients in need of organ transplants by producing replacement organs and tissues. If you think that was impressive, get ready for the second half of 2023, which promises more spacewalks, cargo missions, and the launches of SpaceX Crew-7 and Soyuz MS-24. Later this year, NASA astronaut Frank Rubio, accompanied by Russian cosmonaut Sergei Prokopiev and Dmitry Petalin, will reach the 365-day mark on the 21st of September. They are scheduled to return home in late September, with Rubio set to become the new American record holder for the longest single spaceflight. A huge thank you is owed to my Patreon and YouTube membership supporters, whose kind generosity helps me continue keeping you all in the loop about all things space every single Monday. Consider signing up to either of these programs if you want to see your name on the left there. Otherwise, there are two videos from my channel listed there that YouTube thinks you'll like. Hopefully they're good picks. Thank you all so much for watching this video and I'll catch you in the next one. I have a very special video coming this week. I can't wait to show you. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss that.